Optimal Health Maintenance. He's chairman and CEO of Beyond Health Corporation, a supplier of cutting edge health educational material and world class health supporting products. He's the author of Never Be Sick Again and publisher of Beyond Health News. He is also host and producer of the Beyond Health Show, a syndicated radio talk show. In addition, he's president of Healthy America Foundation, which is dedicated to ending the epidemic of chronic disease in America by sponsoring the project to end disease. I'll give you Ray Francis. So, um, 
that's what I do. And by the way, for people who are concerned or interested in uh, the mind and the effect of the mind on the body and using the mind to heal the body, there is an incredible opportunity coming up this Saturday over at Walnut Creek. And I have some flyers here on it. And uh, there's a yoga master called Mahendra, who has been the yoga teacher to some of the top governments. I have to tell you the bad news, and maybe some of you already know it. The United States is going bankrupt in about 30 years. And the predictions are that the United States will become a third world country in about 30 years. So how do you go from the greatest country in the world to a third world country in 30 years? Well, just watch us. <laughs> just watch us. You don't need to. It's our aging population. It's, uh, it's, we have an aging population and we have a sick aging population. And what we must do, we can't stop people from getting old. But what we must do, and what we can do, is we can stop them from getting sick so they don't run up the Medicare bills. Social Security is, uh, is killing us, uh, but you, know, you can solve the Social Security problem with, the, with, a, you know, with a pen. All you have to do is sign the President's signature on a law and change the retirement age to 80, and you've just solved the Social Security problem. <laughs> The problem we can't solve, which happens to be, by the way, six times as big as the Social Security problem, is the Medicare problem. That's what's going to kill us. And we have to stop people from getting sick. We have to stop them from running up the bills. Can we do this? You betcha we can do it. But we need a massive, unprecedented educational campaign. Just giving people some extra vitamin C every day will go a long way to reducing disease in America. So I'm going to tell you about a little bit how I, I, I reduced all of this to something very simple that anybody can understand. And where did my little balloon go? There you go. You might think this is a balloon. It's not. This is a human cell. All of us started life as a single cell. And the cell had in it all of the information that it needed in order to allow us to develop into the very complex multi-trillion cell organisms that we are. So if we look on ourselves as a single cell instead of the complex things that we are, we can, we can reduce something to great simplicity. If this single cell is you, and if this single cell is operating just the way it's supposed to operate, uh, what does that make you? Healthy. Precisely. Healthy. <laughs> if this cell is you and this cell is malfunctioning, what does that make you? Sick. Sick. Right. You got it. You understand all you need to know. There's only one disease, folks. Either your cells are working right, or they're not working right. And our doctors love to give you know, thousands of different names to these malfunctions. But really what happens is that if you give a cell everything that it needs to operate properly, it'll operate properly. And if you keep it away from things that will injure it and cause it to malfunction, um, then the combination of those two will allow the cell to function as it's supposed to function. So give it what it needs. Don't give it something that can hurt it. So the first thing we call deficiency. If you have, if you have a lack of what you need, that's deficiency. If you have a lot of things that can um, interfere with the proper operation of the cell, we call that toxicity. So deficiency and toxicity are the two causes of the one disease. Now again, our doctors love to confuse themselves by giving different so-called diseases different names. But really, if you have a vitamin C deficiency, the cell will malfunction in a certain way. Uh, if it has a magnesium deficiency, it will malfunction in another way. And you'll get different symptoms. If it has mercury in it, 
it'll malfunction in yet another way. And if it has lead in it, it'll malfunction in yet another way. And by the time you get a whole bunch of uh, uh, a combination of different deficiencies and toxicities, well, just imagine how many different ways the cell can malfunction and how many thousands of diseases you can have. And so what we do is we confuse ourselves by thinking that diabetes is different from Alzheimer's. And it really isn't. They're all the same thing. And as we now found out, there are common malfunctions that take place in almost all diseases. Common malfunctions. So that means that if you address these common things, you can prevent disease. And if you address these common things, you can reverse disease. So we have a lot more control over disease than we think we do. And so by simplifying it down to a single cell and simplifying it down to deficiency and toxicity, the average person is now in the position to begin to think about, am I giving my cells everything they need on a daily basis in order to function properly? Am I giving my cells things that can cause them to malfunction? And that's what you need to be thinking. My book has been curing people of incurable diseases all over the world. We continue to get emails and telephone calls and, and, and notes and cards from people around the world who have been cured of incurable diseases. I had one man call me and he said, you saved my life. And I said, well, what did I do? Well, as it turns out, this man had asthma all of his adult life, and he had just had a terrible asthma attack. He almost died from it. The next day, he was in a bookstore. He bought this book. He read it. He's now been asthma-free for a year and a half. We had a call from a, a doctor in Chicago, and he said, I want to tell you about my patient. His patient was suffering from an inflammatory lung disease called sarcoidosis. This disease chews up your lung tissue. He had it for six years. The man was now in a position to where he needed oxygen to do any kind of exertion. And so his quality of life was zilch. Someone gave him a copy of the book. He read the book. And in 30 days, he was off of all of his drugs. And his lung capacity had increased by 30% by in 30 days. Well, let me tell you something. If you can't breathe, and your quality of life is zilch, and your lung capacity increases by 30%, you have your life back. And here's this man's doctor calling us to tell us of this, uh, this miraculous thing that happened to his patient. And, and what are they doing besides reading the book? Well, they're putting some of, the, well, some of the things in the book to work. And one of the things that we talk about in the book is to get off of what we call the big four. If every American got off of the big four, got themselves a little extra vitamin C and a few other things, we would cut disease in half overnight. But what are the big four? Well, the extremely dangerous poison that we call sugar. That's one of the big four. White flour. Processed oils. That means every oil you buy in a supermarket. And, uh, and milk and dairy products. Those are the big four. Get off of the big four and life will improve. Here's a man with this terrible lung disease. Got off of the big four, he was cured. Here's a man with <coughs> asthma. Got off of the big four and he was cured. It's so simple. There are simple things we can do and we passed out this article here. And uh, if you read this article, if you read it carefully and understand it, in other words, this is not a one minute read, if you read it carefully and understand it, you, in fact, will be one of the leading medical experts in the entire world. Because this is really the future of medicine. This is what it's about. These are the simple, simple, common denominator things that go wrong at the cellular level. And if you address these things in your own life, you will prevent disease and you will cure disease. It's a wonderful, wonderful way to go. And what are some of the things? Well, one of them is, you know, eat too much salt. That screws up the sodium-potassium ratio in our cells. That screws up our, our electrical properties of the cell. Now you're sick. Another thing we do is we eat too much acidic foods. And uh, we end up changing the pH inside of our cells. 
Well, that changes the chemistry of the cell. We end up eating supermarket oils that change the nature of the cell membrane. And when you do that, you change what goes in and what goes out of the cell, and you completely change the chemistry of the cell. So if you continue to eat supermarket oils, you will be sick, guaranteed. So there are a lot of other things that we can all learn to stay away from and things that we need to do, and it's all very simple. And if you go to my website, by the way, there's lots of free articles on my website. I also publish a newsletter that um, has uh, news every other month. Uh, and basically, that's, that's my presentation. It's short and sweet. We have the knowledge, folks. We have the knowledge we have is sufficient to put a stop to this vast, unprecedented epidemic of chronic and degenerative disease. And we must start putting it to work, because if we don't, we won't have a country left. So what are we going to leave to our children and to our grandchildren? You know, it is up to us to start putting this to work and to start spreading the word throughout the United States to everyone so that we can put an end to this. But thank you for listening. I'd like to ask the first question. Now, uh, this, this is kind of a technical, technical question and not really uh, more than that, but just, just kind of to uh, be precise, wouldn't you say that you're not presenting a theory of uh, all disease, but a theory of chronic and degenerative disease, as opposed to thinking of a, the diseases as divided into two big categories, one based on microorganisms, viruses, bacteria, fungi, and so forth, and the other based on deficiencies in toxicity. Uh, well, even, uh, no, this even addresses the, those caused by so-called, because again, uh, viruses don't cause disease, you know. You cause disease when you lower your immunity, when you change your chemistry so that the balance between you and the microbes in your environment is changed. You are causing the flu. You are causing the cold. You are causing the, you know, it's, uh, if your immunity is strong, you won't get sick. You know, there, there, there are several things here. You know, one is the virulence of the bug, you know. The second is how many of the bugs you're exposed to. But the third and most important is the state of your immunity. And, uh, and all of us can work to keep our immunity strong. And one of the first thing you can do to do that is stop eating sugar. Sugar damages your immunity just like that. And so people get colds and they say, oh, well, I went to the office and so-and-so had a cold and I caught it. No, you didn't. You ate some sugar, you know? <laughs> and uh, that's what gave you the cold. Uh, and then if you take some vitamin C, um, and you know a few other things, you'll be very well protected. So uh, does that make you immune from everything? Well, probably not, but immune from most things, yeah. Okay, another question. Yes, yes, yes. Um, there's a paragraph here that I think is just beyond incredible, but I'd like for you to read if you don't mind. Go ahead, read it. Okay, would you please? Or how about you, Bill? Okay, Ray, I'll have you read it. Here we go. Okay. It's right here. Which one? Among, among the... Uh, oh, oh, okay. Among, uh, this is the uh, last paragraph on the uh, left-hand side of the rear, and it says, Among the toxins passed from mother to child, causing disease in the unborn, is mercury. Mercury from dental fillings, vaccinations, and fish interferes with enzymes that control how the fetal brain is structured. Even minor changes in brain structure will affect behavior, learning, higher level thinking, and other brain functions, including control of the immune, hormonal, and digestive systems. Fluoride is another problem. Fluoridated water, toothpaste, and fluoride-contaminated foods pose an enormous health risk to the unborn, lowering their IQs and dumbing down our population. 
Aspartame is another common hazard, an artificial sweetener found in diet drinks and foods. It breaks down into a number of highly toxic chemicals that can damage fetal DNA, alter brain function, and contribute to cancer. To ensure the health of the unborn, we must supply a fetus with everything it needs and protect it from harm. We're, we're dumbing down the population, there's no question. When you look at what's happening, you know, the, the, the SAT tests and the, you know, we keep, we keep dumbing down the tests so the kids aren't embarrassed, and the parents aren't embarrassed, and every time we dumb them down, the kids still don't pass them. So they're getting dumber and dumber and dumber. Um, and, um, and part of the problem is that you don't notice it because you can be, you can have this kind of subtle brain damage that, that interferes with connections in the brain and you can live a perfectly normal life, totally normal life, with the exception that you can't do high level thinking. And I got to tell you, most of the PhDs in engineering and science today in this country are going to foreigners because the Americans are too dumb to be able to get into the school and do it. And the last time I walked through the halls of MIT, which was just last year, I mean, I may as well have been in China. I mean, there weren't any Americans. I mean, they're all Chinese. They're all, you know, uh, it's amazing. Our, our graduate schools are filled with foreigners. Uh, and. Um, and our own people can't do that. You know, what are you going to do if you keep dumbing it down? Our, our whole country is based on technology, you know, our, our, our whole economy, and, uh, and we're dumbing it down so that we can't do it. You know. How much vitamin C should we be concerned? Um, I don't know, but I, I normally recommend 6 to 12 grams a day for an adult, uh, and I normally recommend what, what Dr. Cathcart calls bowel tolerance, for people who have an acute disease problem. Sir. I had a head injury at 81, almost died, couldn't talk, couldn't walk, couldn't speak, legally blind, all of turn off healing, all the things I found were all food. So you put food, it kills enzymes, and unorganic enzymes are dead. Right. And we're all eating dead food in this country. We're all overweight, we're all sick. Think about, about that. Well, um, Mother Nature did not intend us to eat cooked food, and the person that invented it probably should be shot, but they're probably long dead. And uh, I try to limit my, my amount. I do eat cooked food, and it, I travel so much that I have to, but I would say approximately 20% of my diet is cooked food and 80% is raw. And, and, um, and I think everyone should strive for the highest percentage of raw that they can. Mostly grains, grains are for the years to cook to search. Yes, well, grains, uh, humans were apparently never intended to eat grains. And, uh, and yet, that's the staple of our diet today. If we took the grains away, everybody starved to death. So we are fully and totally dependent on grains. Um, but humans apparently were never intended to eat them and they're bad for us. And health, the anthropologists who study this say that as soon as we started eating grains, health went boom. And it's still going boom. Are you, are you saying that the raw grains uh, uh, are bad for you? No, no grain is good for you. No grain. Uh, all grains. All grains. All grains are, are, are bad for you. Yes. Yeah. Whether or not they're both Right, whether or not they're cooked, yeah. What do you think about sprouts? Um, well, sprouts are good. Oh, oh, I see. Well, sprouts are good. Yeah, sprouted grains are good. Yeah. Why no dairy? Why no dairy? Um, well, um, one immediate reason is that most of the dairy is contaminated with, with you know, numerous toxins, including PCBs and dioxins and pesticides and hormones and antibiotics and, uh, uh, and it's also pasteurized and when you pasteurize it you completely change the physical chemical state of the milk um, and uh, you change, uh, you actually <coughs> render some of the uh, uh, protein molecules that are toxic, uh, you, um, uh, you reduce the bioavailability of the minerals, uh, you change, you completely change it. Uh, but then one can make an additional argument is that um, 
uh, no one should drink milk. <coughs> milk is Mother Nature's perfect food, um, but it is the perfect food for the infant of a particular species. The, the chemistry of each milk is, is specific to that species and specific to the needs of the infant of that species. And so in nature, uh, no animal drinks milk after weaning. And, um, and yet we're crazy enough to do this. And not only are we crazy enough to do it, but we're crazy enough to drink cow's milk, which is so far from the chemistry of human milk that it is, is quite toxic to us. And, uh, and, and, then, and then, you know, nobody drinks milk except for a few crazy people anyway. You know, and consider this, you know, 4% of the world's population, 4% drinks more milk than the other 96% put together. And who do you think the 4% is? It's the crazy Americans, right. And so we have this huge epidemic of osteoporosis and, and, and cancer and God knows what else. Uh, it's not healthy. So, and I wrote about it in my book, too. It's more in the book. I also want to mention the reason why American people are so sick of and here you hear your word. I think the reason why so many American people are sick is they vaccinate newborn babies. Yes. And yeah. also the flu shots, they are yeah. tremendously poisonous. Yeah. I, I address this in my book. Uh, I think vaccinations are one of modern medicine's epic blunders. And modern medicine is guilty of a number of epic blunders and vaccinations are one of them. Antibiotics are another, you know, the stupidity of antibiotics. Yeah. It works the kids take to school. I know. I mean I mean the parents have to protect the children. We didn't let our kids do it, but yeah. I mean it was like you were an idiot. That's right. Um, but but isn't it wonderful to be an idiot? Uh, yeah. There there are laws in every state that give the grant exceptions. And, um, and I've heard stories of people who even got legal exceptions and still were not accepted at school, you know. So, uh, but then I was lecturing, uh, I was lecturing up in uh, Milwaukee, and uh, very, very interesting, a group of parents came up to me afterwards and they said, you know, we have a friendly doctor who falsifies the records for us, and none of our kids are vaccinated, and guess what? Whenever a flu epidemic goes through the school, the only kids that don't get sick are ours. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, the mic. So, um, when I read your handout here, um, and hear the 80% uh, raw food, you know, I'm thinking like 10 pounds of broccoli, raw broccoli a day or something. How, how do you do that? <laughs> uh, I just eat, a, I eat a, um, a reasonably normal diet. I eat a lot of salads. Um, this morning, um, uh, for, for breakfast, I had an organic apple, I had an organic kiwi, and I had about a half a cup of almonds. That was my breakfast. Um, lunch was a, a salad with um, uh, mixed greens and you know some um, carrots, celery, um, cucumber, you know, uh, uh, lettuces, um, and uh, and a couple of chopped hard-boiled eggs, which are real eggs, by the way, uh, not not the make-believe ones you buy in a store. Um, and so I, I tend to eat a lot of salads um, and a lot and fresh fruit. Um, and last night I had some fish cooked fish and cooked vegetables. Yeah, tell, tell them about five flu shots in a row and you get... Uh, yes, thousand. yes, well, five, yeah. It, you know, all this nonsense about uh, getting flu shots and, and people saying, you know, they, they feel like they won the lottery if they get a flu shot. <laughs> well, God help them. Um, you know, they've just done a huge amount of damage. First of all, flu shots are useless. And, uh, and secondly, they've just done a huge amount of damage to their immune system which is going to lower their overall competence and make them more susceptible to all kinds of diseases. Um, and uh, Russell Laylock on my show a few weeks back, um, we were talking about this, and, and he said that um, uh, there was a study that found if you had five flu shots in a row, 
that uh, it increased your your risk of Alzheimer's by 1,000 oh. percent. So you know, here's here's mom, you know, in the nursing home getting her her flu shots five years in a row, and then you wonder why the poor thing's losing her mind. You know, it's a, uh, but it's just a side effect, so don't worry about it. Yeah, I just want to interject here that that you know this is a, this is a very diverse group, and everybody has their own view. I personally think that if they get the mercury and some other toxic stuff out of the vaccines, that vaccines are still one of the greatest advances of mankind. No, but uh, we we have to debate that some other time. But uh, Mike. How about juices? Uh, what is your position on juices, fruit juices? Well, I, I, I don't recommend fruit juice at all because uh, I... Uh, you bet. He's asking you. No, no, I'm saying... Oh, you're asking me? Okay. Well, I, I, I don't think fruit juice is a good idea because it raises the, uh, the insulin content. It has sugar. Now, too much fruit has sugar, too. Well, if you eat a piece of fruit, it metabolizes differently, and, and you don't get the you don't get the spike. You know, if you eat a, if you eat an orange, uh, you know how many oranges are you going to eat? Maybe one, and you feel full. Maybe maybe two if you're really a glutton, you know. But if you make orange juice, my God, how many oranges can go into that glass of juice? You've got a lot of sugar there that's very bioavailable and blue. Yeah. Yes, sir. I spent ten days in Costa Rica for all food group. And fresh fruit in the morning, organic, fresh, all the rainforest. Hungry in the afternoon, have coconut milk or a smoothie. Have a snack in the afternoon, dehydrated crust, have some uh, vegetable waste product with fruit, a salad night time. And uh, you get hungry during the day, have a coconut milk or a smoothie. I felt great. Lost weight, great energy. Everybody is sick. And so, see, you're hungry, you eat some vegetables. Until you're full, then stop. Even when you're hungry, you're satisfied. They're using fruit. And the guy in Florida, Doug Graham, clap at her, he says, Olympic runners, pro tennis players, how to eat. He eats just fruit off the trees all day long. He is great, very healthy, never sick. He's really great stature. No way. Well, that's the way Mother Nature yeah. intended it. You know? Right. Yeah, see, there's a difference between the fruit, having fruit, and extracting the juice and in great quantities and having just the juice. Maybe the process is bad. Yeah. Well, you know, even even just squeezing the orange is processing in a way. See, yeah, because it's better than that. Mm -hmm. can juice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you see, the thing is, if you take the juice of the orange away from the fiber and everything else, then you can get this tremendous jolt of, of sugar and your insulin goes shooting up and so forth. Right. 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 Can, can I make a one other comment? Sure. Uh, you know. I'm not well informed about this, but there are these wonderful machines now that you put vegetables into and they turn them into soup and stuff like that. And apparently, I've got a friend who's doing that. She just loves it. I mean, you can add some spices and do this. It makes it makes raw food uh, very palatable, very, very uh, tasty. Yeah, and, and so you buy these machines. I guess they cost a couple hundred bucks, maybe more. And, and you do this. And so some of you probably are aware of this. I'm, I'm looking into it. She's, She's going to get me one because she thinks I'm pretty. She understands I'm pretty slow in making changes in my life. But good <laughs> morning. I have dehydrated cereal. Cereal's dead. So dehydrated cereal and fresh organic almond milk. I love the almond milk. Mm -hmm. Almond. Okay. Okay. What's the machine called? Uh, Vitamix. Vitamix. Okay. <laughs> when you're going to have anything raw, if you're going to have anything raw. First thing you have to realize that it's only going to be as good as the soil. Period. That's where it's coming from. The second part of agribusiness is, is that it's picked before it ever ripens. So it has different enzymatic activity. So the question is, can you really eat your way to health? And it's a real debate. Um, the, the answer is almost no, and that's why supplements are necessary. Supplements are a fourth class way of getting nutrients. Uh, but I don't think I can live without them. And I recommend everyone take them because it's almost impossible to get food in America today. There is simply no food available. Um, unless you become a hunter-gatherer and you learn how to hunt and gather, you can't purchase food. It is not purchasing, you go to a supermarket, there's nothing there. It's all garbage. Um, and and, and I, I talked with a farmer, I was giving a speech up in Sebastopol, I talked with an apple farmer up there, um, and I said, why can't I get any apples? I mean, I know what an apple is. My uncle had an apple farm when I was a kid. So I know what an apple is. Why can't I get an apple? 
He said, well, back in the old days, uh, the local apple farmers, you know, there were small stores, and uh, the farmers sold to the stores, and, uh, and they sold them apples. He said, today, it's all centrally done, and all the apples go to one central place, and they go into storage, and the old apples come out of storage, and then are sold as fresh. What you're getting is a useless piece of garbage. That is not an apple. There's nothing in it. It's garbage. And then we think this is food. Well, dream on. Um, you know, it's like eggs. I tried to find an egg. I couldn't find an egg. I, get, I, I import my eggs from New Zealand. Um, you know, and I'm going to go out to a farm um, in Marin in a couple of weeks uh, to uh, inspect the farm. And, um, and if they meet my approval, I'm going to approve the farm, and, um, and they may indeed have eggs, which would be a, a, a huge, you know, boon for the people in the Bay Area to have eggs available. Yeah. What they never talk about is when they fertilize and pesticize the ground, because they kill the microorganisms, they right. literally would make the, uh, the produce come to life. When you break that chain, you can feed it with phosphorus and ammonia and all the rest of the crap that they throw in there. Yeah. But what you really have is a fake plant. It may look like it's real, but it's really make fake believe. Food. It's make believe. Right. There's no nutrition in it. Right. And uh, and we're eating this, and that's what we're supposedly living on, and that's why we're all dying. You know, because you've had to hand up for a long time. Let me, inter let me interrupt though. There's there's a white Lexus that's blocking some people. So if you have a white Lexus. Could you just kind of swing it out and let these other people out, and then you could probably get yourself a nice car. Anybody have a white Lexus? Anybody? What kind? Where okay, at? What parking okay. lot? Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. What parking lot is it at? Mine's over in the store parking lot. Do you know what parking lot is in San It's always a little administrative detail. So in the meantime, what? I'm sorry. I can... What was the drug that you took? What was the drug that I took? Um, Metronidazole. It's an antibiotic type of drug. And uh, it's heptatoxic. Uh, and, um, and certainly was heptatoxic to me. It blew my liver out. How long did you take for uh, I don't remember the amount, and I think I just took it for a week or ten days, something like that. Was it 500 milligrams? I don't remember the amount. Uh, if I may ask, for what condition did you feel? For what? For what condition it, uh, it was a parasite, parasitic infection. Okay. I got rid of the parasites. <laughs> Very effective. He still has his hand up. Yes, sir. Okay, the, the white actor wasn't my question, but... No, 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 no okay, let's well, Now, some of the, like, the, young, the fellow here talked about the soils being, you know, disrupted with the chemicals they're doing. Now, uh, we would consider the American Indians being people that, you know, you're going far back, there wasn't no chemicals, none of that stuff. It looks like they were living a life to where they were eating fresh meat, vegetables that they would plant themselves, perhaps a little stress. Yet when they were invaded, perhaps either from the Europeans, or whites, or whatever, they got the common cold or they died off. Mm -hmm. Now, for what reason, if we think that their immune systems would be much stronger than even ours, I mean, what is it that made them just die off like that? Well, um, one answer is stress. Um, you know, I come from Massachusetts originally, and, um, and all the Indians there, you know, died off with smallpox and God knows what else, and measles. And, um, but the stress on these people, as we were, you know, pushing them, changing their lives, pushing them out of their homes and making them move further out into the... Uh, I would imagine that they were under an enormous amount of stress. Um, so. I think, that's, I think that's a great uh, proof that it's not possible to get enough vitamin C in the diet. Well, I think that's, that's another uh, thing. They very well may not have been getting enough vitamin C in, in their diet. It's not possible. Yeah. Hey, Ray, let me, have, let me take this man's question as the last question, and then sure. we'll, we'll, we'll have a break, and we'll, and we'll uh, get on with the second thing. 
to ask you the uh, validity of uh, your opinion of the validity of the science that Barry Sears came up with hormonally balancing each meal, uh, how valid that is to you. And the second part is, are there some diets better for other people than, uh, you know, is it split up in percentages of the population, or one that's better on another kind of diet? Um, I, I don't put much scientific stock in Barry Sears. Um, I, I think he's on very weak ground scientifically, but that's just my, my opinion. Um, and as far as diets go, they don't work. What we need to do is get on a human diet. We have to start eating what our ancestors ate, and that's, that's what we need to do. Um, they get on these crazy diets, you know, uh, just, it's just nonsense, it's just nonsense. Just by the way, just on this subject, so for those of you who haven't reflected on this fact, it's kind of startling to realize that, that uh, our ancestors and even our pre-human ancestors lived on a diet for millions of years and, and then human beings lived for hundreds, at least 100,000 years on a diet before the agricultural revolution. It wasn't until the agricultural revolution about probably 8,000 or 10,000 years ago that gra grains were introduced into our diet. So grains are a really a new thing that's happened, it's kind of like, uh, you know, what part of what it being modern is, I guess. And so it isn't so radical as it seems to suggest that grains may be aren't the best thing for us because that isn't actually what our bodies evolved to depend upon. But anyway, um, well, let's take a five minute break and then we'll come back. We have a tremendous presentation on vitamin D. The, the Science News had two important articles in the last two weeks, which I put on the desk over here. For those of you who hadn't picked them up, pick up those articles on vitamin D, and then we'll help Bill Grant on vitamin D. Yeah. JPL and NASA. He is the author of over 60 articles in peer-reviewed journals. He is currently the director of Sunlight and Nutrition and Health Research Center that is devoted to research, education, and advocacy of changes in diet and lifestyle to prevent chronic diseases. He published the first paper linking diet to Alzheimer's disease and identifying the major risk factors. He is also published many other articles on dietary factors, including sweeteners as a risk factor for heart disease, meat as a risk factor for the uh, ex, you know, I can't even this thing. Expression. Ex expression of rheumatoid arthritis, the role of animal products in generating insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1, and its role as a risk for cancer how vitamin D reduces the risks and mortality rate of many cancers in relationship, relationships to geographical areas. His current research projects include the role of vitamin D in reducing the risk and symptoms of multiple sclerosis and the roles of maternal vitamin D in alcohol consumption on fetal development. I'll give you Bill Grant. Turn this on. It was very common, but it took until the 1920s until they realized that vitamin D produced by sunlight was the active uh, material that fought it. And for years, cod liver oil was given to supply vitamin D. Uh, in fact, it turns out in America that breastfed African American babies in North Carolina are still getting rickets. 
Um, so vitamin D plays a key role both in calcium and perhaps other metal absorption and metabolism. Low values of serum 25-OHD increase uh, parathyroid hormone and the PTH pulls calcium from the bones to maintain proper calcium levels in the blood. So if you have, you have to have this, I mean, calcium is, is maintained very, very tightly in the blood, so you've got this push-pull from the 25-OHD and the PTH. Um, internal cancers. Um, Cedric and Frank Garland in, in La Jolla, uh, California, looked at the sort of the distribution of cancer mortality in the United States, and especially colon cancer, around 1980, and saw that uh, there was a the cancer rates were much higher in the northeastern United States than they were in the southwest, and this ratio is about two to one. And so they hypothesized at that time that it was through sunlight and production of, of vitamin D that actually reduced the risk of cancer in the southern uh, states. Uh, and that was before they had any idea of what the mechanism might be. Uh, later they realized that calcium plays a role in reducing the risk of, of, of colon cancer as well. They went on to, to find similar patterns for breast cancer, I think that was in Canada, ovarian cancer in, in the Soviet Union, or vice versa. And others also realized that the match for, for prostate cancer again showed a, um, this latitudinal effect. It wasn't until the late 1990s, early 2000s, that the, the mechanism whereby vitamin D reduced the risk of cancer were understood. Uh, and part of the reason was that people were a bit afraid of UV because they were afraid of the skin cancer melanoma problems. Uh, the mechanisms are well known, uh, there'd be no test, but it, it sort of slows the growth of, of some, it, it reduces some of the growth stimulating uh, um, signals on, on things like tumors. It helps the cells become different types of cells. It reduces blood uh, angiogenesis or blood uh, uh, um, artery or capillary formation around tumors um, uh, and also modulates the immune responsiveness. So that these are being studied in the laboratory uh, and, and they're, they're fairly well known by now. Uh, when I got involved in this, in this project around the year 2000, uh, I tried to explain the, the uh, high factor two between the Northeast and the Southwest on, on, based on dietary factors. But I uh, quickly realized that this would entail the Northern European diet in the Northeast and the Southeast Asian diet in the Southwest. And anybody who's traveled around the country knows that we don't have that kind of differential diet. I will eat McDonald's now, I suppose. <laughs> um, working for NASA and studying ozone, I was aware of the ultraviolet radiation measurements made by a satellite instrument called the Total Ozone Mapping Spectrometer. Um, and as you can see uh, from the, the map here, that the distribution of the ultraviolet B radiation hitting the Earth's surface in the United States is very asymmetrical. Uh, it is much higher on the uh, western side than on the eastern side. And that's for two primary reasons. Uh, one is that uh, the surface elevation is higher, so uh, uh, there's less intervening atmosphere that's going to uh, scatter the UVB. And the other is that uh, as the winds come across the, from the ocean across the, the land over the Rockies, they push the stratosphere higher, and so it's less ozone. So for those two reasons, we have more ultraviolet B radiation on the west coast than on the east coast, except in California, along the coast, down on the fog, because the hot air in the Central Valley pulls in the coastal air, and we get the fog all summer. So we really have a problem here in, in this area. Now, if you look at the colon cancer map, like the one that, that Cedric and Frank Garland looked at, you see what I'm talking about. The, the colon cancer rates for white females are up to around 20, 22 in the Northeast, and down to around 7 to 10 in the Southwest. It's a factor of two difference. And you really can't explain that by, by diet. Something else, uh, breast cancer has a very similar pattern, around 30 in the Northeast, down around 15 in the Southwest. Ah, but all of a sudden you see in California and Nevada, you've got some red spots. And the Bay Area has a, has a hot spot. Well, when I first, uh, go back to, to a little history now, when I first published my findings on cancer in 2002, I only used the, 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 uh, the UVB uh, from, from this map here. And the critics rightly pointed out 
that there are many factors that affect a cancer other than, than just UVB. So in my current work, I've, um, uh, oops, um, I've included alcohol consumption, Hispanic heritage, population changes, living in poverty, uh, smoking, uh, the effects of smoking, and whether one lives in an urban or rural environment. Uh, now if we look at, at the map here for adult per capita alcohol consumption from 1970, Lo and behold, California is in the second decile. There are only four or five states in the country that have more per capita alcohol consumption than California does. And there was a study that came out last year showing that part of the reason there's a high incidence of breast cancer in Marin County is because of the alcohol consumption. It's, it's a known risk factor for breast cancer. Uh, you see you've got other problems in other places. The other factor here is the degree of urbanization. If you work indoors and live indoors and commute in a vehicle, when are you going to get your vitamin D? It turns out that, that the UVB radiation is the primary source for vitamin D for most people on Earth. The only people that that, that doesn't apply to are the Japanese who get a lot of from fish and the Scandinavians who have to get it from fish. They just cannot make enough vitamin D in the summer to carry them over through the winter. So they were on cod liver oil for a long time. So, a lot of the breast cancer in California is related to the alcohol and the uh, urbanization and some of the lack of vitamin D. Um, what I've shown here is that if I do my statistical analysis and develop a model that explains everything uh, for most states, that's the black dots. And then I, then I say, okay, now suppose everybody lived in a rural environment, was outside every day working on the farm. Then the curve would shift by about six, uh, six, six deaths per hundred thousand per per, uh, per year. Uh, so what I've been able to do in my study now, which is almost accepted by Mayo Clinic Proceedings, Mayo Clinic Proceedings has, is a fairly large uh, circulation uh, uh, journal, and and uh, I've got a little bit more cleaning up to do, and I think it'll be accepted and should be published in about three months. But I found that. There are 18 types of cancer for which UVB and therefore by extension vitamin D are protective. It's a lot of the aerodigestive tract, breast, reproductive organs, other organs, and, and blood cancers. I mean this is most of the important uh, cancers. Um, seven types I've correlated with, with um, uh, living, well, you get risk reduction if you live in a rural environment and or live where there's a lot of UVB. Uh, urban residence was not associated independently with, with cancer related smoking, so we can't say that the, the effect was due to, to pollution in cities. So I'm claiming that urban residence is a major factor reducing the amount of UVB and vitamin D. As far as the other risk factors go, I showed that lung cancer is correlated with 12 types of cancer. Hispanic heritage with five, and that's due to both genetics and diet. That alcohol consumption is related to seven types of cancers. And so what I've been able to show is that my model, using fairly simple, publicly available data, were able to help explain a lot of the geographic variations in cancer mortality in the United States. And I still had UVB and, and, and urban residents in there. And so one almost has to include that that it has to be due to the vitamin D aspects of the solar radiation. So that, that's the part on cancer, to motivate you to think that vitamin D, especially as you get older, it is very important. Now before I go into the multiple sclerosis story, let me ask two questions. How many in the audience know somebody who has multiple sclerosis? Okay, that's about half the audience. How many of you have heard that vitamin D likely both reduces the risk of multiple sclerosis and be used to reduce the symptoms of multiple sclerosis. Well, half of the wants to know somebody. Okay, well, <laughs> you may know someone eventually. Okay. I'll spend a moderate amount of time on it then. Uh, what's well known, and has been known for almost 100 years now, is that there are very strong latitudinal gradients of multiple sclerosis prevalence in Australia, Europe south of 60 degrees north latitude, and the United States. 
is also been found a few years ago, in the 19, uh, year 2000, that childhood ultraviolet ex B exposure, especially in winter, greatly reduces the risk of multiple sclerosis. And it was found in the United Kingdom that those with skin cancer have half the rate of multiple sclerosis the rest of the population. Uh, here is the, the curve, I gen the model I generated for multiple sclerosis prevalence for veterans entering World War II and the Korean conflict at the time they entered, the, 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 they took the physical. And this was done by uh, Dr. Kurtzke, uh, who was with the Veterans Administration. And he's, year after year, he, he generates these uh, data points. And, and as far as he's concerned, multiple sclerosis is due to a viral or, or some other type of infection that, uh, that attacks, uh, leads to an autoimmune disease, and so on. But he can't explain the latitudinal effect. Well, it's a very strong latitudinal effect. But you see here, it's, it's not the same sort of, I mean, it's a straight latitudinal effect. It doesn't have the asymmetry that we found for cancer. Uh, we go on that, that, well, there are other things that, that point to, to vitamin D. And what this seems to indicate, and we're writing a manuscript to this effect, is that it's the vitamin D in winter that's most important because that's when it can keep the immune system strong at a time when infectious disease rates are highest. And it turns out that the active form of the vitamin D, the vitamin D hormone, inhibits the production of IL-12, which is a cytokine involved in the development of Th1 cells, and, and these in the, uh, relate to autoimmune diseases. Now, we've got to note that this is a, a, a scientific conclusion not yet adopted by the medical community. Nonetheless, I estimate that 40 to 70 percent of multiple sclerosis in the United States could have been prevented uh, through adequate vitamin D, especially in winter. Um, and, and the circulating vitamin D levels are lowest in winter. Circulating vitamin D is, goes about half of what it is in the summer, just because you aren't in the sun making much more. Uh, there's also two findings, one from uh, uh, Germany and Canada and one from San Diego, showing that there are annual variations in the number of lesions that a person with multiple sclerosis has. Uh, high in the winter, low in the summer. A much long, a greater variation in Canada and Germany than there is in San Diego, again tying it to a, um, to a UV vitamin D effect. So those who have multiple sclerosis can benefit from vitamin D, either from supplements, or natural or artificial ultraviolet B radiation. Ashton Emery, who's a PhD in geology and working with me on the manuscript, uh, is, uh, his son has multiple sclerosis, so he, he's had to look into this in a big way. And he's actually formed an organization that's raised 400,000 Canadian to do the clinical studies that no government seems to want to fund. I mean, the government seems to be afraid of UV and vitamin D because of skin cancer melanoma, I suppose. Okay, that's multiple sclerosis. Now, those are the two I'm going to do in, in the greatest amount of, of depth. Uh, let me just sort of briefly mention some of the other uh, diseases and conditions that ultraviolet B radiation and vitamin D help prevent. Muscle pain and weakness. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced some uh, sort of increasing muscle pain in winter that goes away in summer. Well, that was shown by Greg Plotnikoff last year in Mayo Clinic Proceedings to be related to lack of vitamin D in winter. And by, by giving people vitamin D uh, in winter, you can re re reduce that, that weakness. It's also been found that rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis, that the progression is related to, to it can be slowed by more vitamin D. And uh, type 1 diabetes, there's a very good study in, in Finland uh, two, three, four years ago, showing that those babies that had the large vitamin D supplements in the first year of life had 20% risk of getting type 1 diabetes compared to those who, who didn't get the, the, that much, uh, the large, the, 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 the supplements. Type 1 diabetes is also a disease for which there's a very, very pronounced seasonal birth rate. You have many more people with type 1 diabetes born in summer than you do in winter. On the other hand, they often get their type 1 diabetes uh, first in winter. And it appears that, that maternal vitamin D levels are related to uh, risk of vitamin, uh, type 1 diabetes.
type 2 diabetes has some link to vitamin D. Uh, it turns out that the larger person is, the more fat one has, the more fat, fat uh, vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, and so the vitamin D will go to the fat tissues and just is not available then to be used for, for therapeutic or, or, or whatever uh, reason, applications. Um, I'm worried there are a number of diseases from, from uh, autism disease to, to bipolar disorder um, to lack of repro reduced reproductive success in uh, for women born in summer and all sorts of things like that that have very pronounced seasonal variations either born in the spring, winter, spring, or summer. And one of my next projects is to try to see if I can link those to maternal either vitamin D deficiency or in the case of schizophrenia, it seems more likely that it's maternal alcohol consumption during summer. But these are, are, are very interesting uh, topics to work on and the sort of thing that the literature has just not been able to handle very well for the last 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, Crohn's disease is where the, the, the gut uh, intestines cannot absorb very well. And these people often have a vitamin D deficiency because they can't absorb things, even vitamin D, but they get their vitamin D from, uh, from UV, either from sunlight or from indoor tanning. Uh, high blood pressure can be somewhat controlled by vitamin D. There's a pronounced increased uh, rate of, of hypertension as you go away from the equator. And I think that uh, there's been some studies showing that UVB, uh, through producing vitamin D, can lower blood pressure a few points. Heart disease, that's related somewhat to blood pressure and somewhat to muscle strength. And again, that appears to be related somewhat to vitamin D. And tuberculosis. Uh, there are well, many cases of, of tuberculosis, especially when the dark-skinned immigrants to, to London who are not getting their vitamin D, a lot of tuberculosis. And a lot of cases of tuberculosis uh, along with rickets. So um, they're, they're doing a lot, they seem to be helping there. Uh, here's a new, I just found this, uh, came across the web the other day, uh, that vitamin D is criti cri cri critical to the production of sperm, and the lack of, of the nutrient may be linked to male infertility. Uh, and uh, so, uh, anyway, vitamin D is, has played a role here as well, especially among men. And um, so, okay, now let's get to sources of vitamin D. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, solar ultraviolet B radiation is the most important source for most people on Earth. Dietary sources provide some uh, fish, and fortified food provides some. Uh, in America, what's fortified is milk, and now orange juice. But you go to Europe, and most countries do not fortify milk, um, unless they're the northern, like the Scandinavian countries. <coughs> supplements are a good source of vitamin D, and I, I occasionally take supplements. And also ultraviolet lamps that mimic the solar ultraviolet radiation reaching the Earth's surface are also a good source. By mimicking, I mean 3 to 5% of the radiation should be in the UVB range, the rest in the UVA range. Um, Okay, the, the blood level of serum 25 OHD uh, is highest in summer and lowest in the winter or late winter, early spring. Uh, there's often about a factor of two in, in the mid-temperate mid uh, and higher regions. Uh, in Boston, there was a study showing that in the top, in the darkest four or five months of the year, it is impossible to make any vitamin D on a rooftop, tar uh, stark, uh, totally naked. I mean, just not enough UVB getting through the, the atmosphere to generate any, any vitamin D in the, in, the, in the skin. So at that time, it's either stored 25 OHD from fatty, fatty tissues that, that's used, or you have to have other sources, such as supplements or other sources. And this just shows that for January, the erythemal exposure, which is the, includes UVA and UVB that makes the, the burn the skin, is very high in the south, but almost absent in the north. Okay, now the levels of serum 25 OHD. Deficiency is categorized as below 10 nanograms per milliliter, or they have another unit, which is two and a half times that, called nanomoles per liter, as 25 nanomoles per liter. Insufficiency is between 10 and 30 nanograms per, per milliliter. Uh, below 40 nanomoles uh, per liter, the circulating uh, hormone levels fall, the 125 OHD levels fall. And for bone health and other conditions, 
optimal is up to around 90 nanomoles per liter. Uh, as you get older, you need a little bit more. It turns out, as you get older, it's harder to, to make vitamin D, and you probably need it uh, a bit more. And that's when you can probably get cancer, and bone diseases, and, and so on. Um, according to Reinhold Vieth in Canada, uh, if you take one or 40 IU per day, that'll increase your circulating 25 OHD by one to no four nanomoles per liter. Uh, so taking 1,000 IU per day corresponds to a, a steady state level of 25 to 100 nanomoles per liter, which is, is anywhere from, from just barely sufficient to, to more than adequate. Well, it turns out the conversion from, from taking vitamin D internally and actually producing it in the, in the, in the, um, in the, in the blood has maybe a factor of four, five, or six variation. So you cannot just tell everybody you should be taking 400 or 600, 800, or 1,000 IU per day. Ashton Emery, for example, takes five, four or 5,000 IU per day, and he has levels below mine. I was taking 1,000 a day plus, plus doing indoor tanning, and my levels got up to 82 uh, uh, nanograms, or around 150, 160, uh, or no, 200, or over 200 nanomoles, which is way too high. So I had to stop taking the supplements and doing the indoor tanning, and I'm now down around 60 of the um, 60 units, which is still a little bit too high, so 150 of the nano nanomoles per liter. The the problem with um, let's see if I can go in. Okay, the present day guidelines call for 400 IU per day for young and middle aged people, 600 for those a bit older, and 800 for those over the age of 70. But these guidelines were developed in terms of rickets and osteoporosis and bone diseases. Um, as we're finding out now, the vitamin D has many, many roles for soft tissue diseases, and so they're talking about trying to revive, revise these, these guidelines. Now, unfortunately, the only accurate way to determine your, the proper dose and your vitamin D intake requirements is through testing your serum 25 OHD. Uh, there's a lab, there's several places to do it. The place that's most convenient is called Lab One. They have a laboratory someplace in the eastern United States. Uh, if you call the number, the 1-800-646-7788 number, they'll tell you where you can go locally. There, there's one place in San Francisco on Grum Street. I think it's called Overseas Medical Center. Um, but they, they, the Overseas Medical Center wants you to have your own Lab One card because the billing between Lab One and this, this Overseas Medical Center is a little difficult. Uh, so it's best you have your own car and then you get a cheaper rate as well. So you pay for your, your first uh, uh, drawing. Uh, you do have to have a doctor or nutritionist or a chiropractor, somebody, authorize you to, to have your blood drawn for this purpose. You can't just go to the overseas medical and say, I want to have my blood drawn. You've got to have somebody saying, you, you've got to have it for, for whatever reason. Uh, who should be tested? I would recommend that doctors request serum 25 OHD tests for any patients who have diseases for which vitamin D is thought to reduce the risk, progression, or symptoms, or who live largely indoors. Uh, I would be interested in working with, with such MDs to help interpret the findings in terms of the, the literature, and uh, I don't know, maybe perhaps a study could be done on, on the level of, of serum 25 OHD among patients in, in the Bay Area. Uh, there have been, there are a few studies that are done on interns working in Boston, but, but it'd be better to have more studies done throughout the country. I think also anyone who only takes more than a thousand IU per day should, should really uh, think about having their, their levels tested. Because there are a couple of important risks for having too much 25 OHD. One is you can have the problem, the, the, the risk of having reduced bone mineral density. Uh, Kristen Sullivan, a nutritionist in Marin County, uh, has seen people who went to other doctors when they weren't seeing her, who told them to take massive doses of vitamin D, you can't have too, too much. And they just overloaded their, their system with vitamin D to the point where they started to lose bone mass. And so she's had to put them on a special regimen and try to get their, their serum 25 OHD levels down. And the other thing that's become, that's just become apparent this year is that men may be at risk, a greater risk of prostate cancer for having levels of, of 25 OHD that are too high. That was found in, in tests, uh, studies in, in Scandinavia. 
where they looked at serum, stored to serum 24-FOHD and subsequent development of prostate cancer and found that those who had either uh, much above the population mean or much below the population mean had an increased risk. And what I was able to show with the United States uh, uh, mortality map for prostate cancer is that, again, uh, it appeared that, that wintertime levels, if they fell low like they did in the northern latitudes, that was risk factor. But if they got too high like they do in the southwest, that was also risk factor. So, you know, as, as we start to study this more, I'm sure we'll find more reasons not to get too much. So, now, now how much <coughs> solar UV B exposure? Michael Hollick, who's, who's one of the foremost authorities on the vitamin D, and you'll see his name in the news quite a bit, he's got a book called, called The UV Advantage, uh, is now recommending that you need to expose 25% of your body to midday solar radiation two or three times a week during summer to produce the amount of vitamin D considered uh, optimal. For how long? Uh, oh, uh, okay, he's saying about a quarter to a half of your erythemal dose. If you're fair-skinned, that may be, may, may be, might be 30 minutes, you might, might start burning, so you want to drop it down to 15 minutes. If you're uh, a black American, that may be several hours. So it depends on your skin type, and, and you can probably, if you start in the spring going out and staying out longer, you can probably find where, where, where you're going to uh, uh, start burning and back off from that. Uh, but, since the cancer mortality rates vary very by a factor of two from the southwest and northeast, uh, I think the amount of time in the sun for vitamin E production varies depending on location. And one of the projects I have in mind is to try to develop a vitamin D production map for the United States but I'm still trying to get the conversion factors from solar UVB to vitamin D, uh, and so on, in terms of skin and in humans. Uh, okay, now the dermatologists are always telling us, stay out of the noonday sun, put on uh, uh, sunblock, slip, slap, slop, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the sun is your foe, uh, you can, even with sunblock, you can still make enough vitamin D, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that might work in Australia, but hey, I've got to tell you folks, this is not Australia. I've been in Australia, and it's like being in an aviary. You've got wild birds all around, you've got bright sun, and you've got fair skin. Anyway, this is not Australia. So, uh, it turns out the risk factors for skin cancer include skin type. Blacks don't get skin cancer to speak of. They're protected with the melanin in their skin. The number of moles you have, you develop a lot of moles, perhaps by a lot of sunburning when you were young, that's a risk factor. Uh, if you have a lot of painful sunburns, if you have a high fat, low vegetable diet, don't have any antioxidants in your system, uh, that's a risk factor. Vitamin C, I think, would reduce the risk. Smoking is a risk factor. It generates free radicals. Alcohol consumption, I think, is a risk factor. And, but it also turns out that lifetime dosing of UV is also a risk factor, especially the UVB, because that can damage the DNA. And the antioxidants, as I said, they can both uh, a beta carotene is actually like, like nature's sunscreen. You eat carrots and you get an orange skin, that will block the UV from penetrating. That's, um, that, that, that seems to work. But your antioxidants, vitamin C, vitamin uh, E, selenium, and so on, either external or internal, will help reduce the risk of sunburn and skin cancer. You can take uh, fresh ascorbic acid, mix it in water, and spray it on your skin before, during, and after uh, sunning yourself, and that will help reduce inflammation and, and burning. Melanoma is also related to a number of factors including sunburning, diet, smoking, number of moles, and use of sunscreen. The problem with sunscreen here is that sunscreen primarily blocks the UVB and part of the UVA. But it, as far as I can tell, melanoma is more related to UVA, the longer wave ultraviolet radiation, than the shorter wave. So, and it turns out that developing melanin, uh, developing pigmentation in your skin, will actually uh, help protect you from, from the deep penetrating UVA. And it turns out that, that uh, uh, in the Netherlands, Canada, and, and uh, Denmark, people who are occupationally exposed to ultraviolet radiation have a reduced risk of melanoma because they get a nice tan. The farmers, the postmen, and so on, they, they have a reduced risk for melanoma. So if you, if you put on the sunscreen and you don't block all the UVA, you stay in the sun longer, you're going to get more of the dose of the free radicals. Um, 
Also, melanoma rates increase with latitude for those still living in their ancestral homelands. Um, anyway, that, that's another story. My estimate of premature cancer deaths from the 18 types of cancer I, I mentioned for the period 1970-1994 is 21,000 males and 25,000 females per year dying for lack of enough UVB or vitamin D. During this people, 5,000 died from melanoma and 1,900 from melanoma skin cancer per year. So this is a ratio of 6.6 .6 to 1 for, for mother cancer versus those from melanoma and, 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 and non-methane skin cancer. And that's not even going into all the other diseases where UVB and vitamin D are beneficial. But what do you read in the newspaper? Stay out of the sun. It's harmful. Uh, okay, why has vitamin D been underappreciated? In part, no one profits from selling natural solar ultraviolet B radiation. I mean, <laughs> there are the sunscreen people who make four or five hundred million dollars a year selling sunblock to get you to go into the sun, but they're blocking the UVB. Uh, the indoor tanning folks profit from selling artificial solar UV radiation, but their pockets aren't very deep, I found out. Uh, vitamin D as a supplement is very cheap. Um, People are also afraid of sunburns, wrinkles, skin cancer, melanoma. And for whatever a number of reasons, the, 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 the research on the health benefits of, of UVB and vitamin D has just been very, very slow. I mean, I go to the American Cancer Society and say, hey, you know, I've shown this about cancer and, UV, and vitamin D. Would you like a further study? No, we know that UVB causes skin cancer. End of story. <laughs> Same with Cancer Research UK. In fact, I've, I've got a, a letter just it's being published in the Journal of Cosmetic Dermatology, uh, which is a British journal, showing that of about 14 websites concerned about cancer and skin cancer and so on, most of those say stay out of the sun, use sunblock and all that. Only one or two of them even mentioned that you need some vitamin D. And so I'm going to take them to task for that. They can on one hand say avoid the sun, without on the other hand say you need your vitamin D. If you don't get it from the sunlight, then you've got to take supplements or something else. So, summary and conclusion, vitamin D is essential for optimal health. Solar UVB is the primary source of vitamin D for most people on Earth. Optimal levels are between 40 and 90 nanomoles per liter. And in the absence of solar UVB radiation, supplements, food sources, and UVB lamps, such as in tanning salons, <coughs> can supply adequate vitamin D. For further information, you can log on to my website, which is www.sunarc.org. And that's hosted by Robert Wagner and Tony Cowdery at, at Aegis Corporation in Florida. Uh, and then you can also email, and I'm going to post the, the, uh, the, the slides at the website in the next few days. I'll, I'll send it in tonight and they'll post it maybe tomorrow or so. And you can also email me at wgrant at sunarc.org. And I don't have time for it, but, but behind this is a, um, uh, a, a sort of policy guidelines for, for UV and vitamin D. And then on the website, there are a lot more papers and, and images and web, uh, links to other websites. So. Um, if the 25-hydroxy vitamin D, you, you said that's the one that you need to measure. It's the only one that you can measure. Why shouldn't you use the dihydroxy to measure that and use that as a measurement of your vitamin okay. D status? Yeah. Good question. Um, in fact, 10, 20 years ago, they, they tried to do that. But the thing is that just like calcium is well regulated in, 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 the, in the blood, so is the 125 OH2D3. It's very, very tightly controlled. But it turns out, furthermore, that the organs that need the hormonal action, they grab the circulating type and convert it. There's a paracrine or per whatever, there's a process where they can actually add the OH as required to make it active. So they can just use the ordinary circulating. It's like you get water in the tap, okay, then you put hot water and you put it on the, on the stove. Same thing that the organs do. I heard, I heard there's different types of vitamin D, yes. D3, and there's the ones that you take through cod liver oil or from liver uh, and you get an overdose on versus stuff you get in the sun, you just can't overdose. Okay, yeah. Um, but actually, the, the, the D2 and a D3. And I think it's, doctors may often inject massive doses of the D2, which is much less 
readily converted to active form in the body. Uh, but milk and, and orange juice have a D3. In terms of cod liver, yeah, you can easily overdose on cod liver oil or supplements. There's another problem with cod liver oil and fish oil uh, tablets. They often have the vitamin A with the vitamin D. And it turns out the two sort of compete with each other for calcium uptake in, in the intestines. So, uh, and, and then there's something about uh, sunlight will help destroy or produce vitamin A. I haven't really worked out that story, but uh, you've got to be careful when you get the vitamin D to see whether it has a vitamin A with it and figure out whether you want that. But there's also another story which I haven't fully uh, studied yet, which is that uh, part of the time when you, when you have the various forms of vitamin D in your skin and in your blood, the, uh, probably the UVA can destroy that. And so you, it sort of limits, sort of dose regulating. It sort of is able to, you know, sort of balance it. Whereas if you take a, internally through supplements or cod liver oil, you don't have that effect. Um, the book, the 120 year diet, recommends somewhere between 16 and 20 miles of running a week. You get out in the sun and you run somewhere between 60 and 20 miles a week. That comes to something like three hours in the sun. Um, and with a normal track suit, that lines up nicely with what you've been saying. Yes, yes. You, you're a runner, aren't you? What's that again? You're a runner? Yes. Yeah. Walking walks works just as well. Better <laughs> <laughs> Um, I wonder how many people here have had that 25 hydroxy test. I wanted to point out something. Nobody's had it. One back there. Now it turns out that the uh, new guidelines, and you don't have to go to lab one, all the local doctors here that are alternative, like Shaw, Guilford, Brower, all give you know that uh, test. Uh, but it turns out that the in the nanograms per milliliter. The recommended amount is 40 to 55, which would be a little higher in your animals, going up to 120. I, was, I forget the exact number. But I, I personally have been measuring mine, and I found that 3,000 IU was not enough for me. I was down at the 35 nanogram level, and I had to take calcitriol. Now, I don't know if that's a D2 or not, but calcitriol is what the D3 converts to, and you have to take that in micrograms. You usually don't give more than a half. <coughs> I took a quarter, plus the 3,000, still didn't reach the optimum until I took a half. And I took a half microgram of the calcitriol, which has to be prescribed, plus the 3,000 D3 and some stuff, then I got into the optimum of about 55 uh, on the nanograms per milliliter, which you have to multiply either. I thought it was point, uh, 3 .9 or 2 .1, or 2 .5 or 2 one of those two. 2.5 or 2 is the version. So uh, that's the, uh, uh, so if some people get stuck in a low range, can keep taking it, and can get there, and some people can get there with a thousand or a yeah, uh, I think you also have to watch out, if you've been deficient for many years, you may have to sort of build up your reservoir, build up the vitamin in your fatty tissues. And so you probably want to test again after a while to see if you, if you sort of reach the threshold and start it. Yeah, especially guys. Yes. That suggests if you're uh, losing a pound of fat a week, you probably are going to have another situation where you start overdosing and start getting too much. Possibly, yeah. Yes. Have you discovered the biochemical connection to vitamin D and cancer? Well, is there a uh, proliferation? Uh, somewhere I have the, uh, let's see here. Way back to Say, did you get the letter Now here we are. Here are all the, the mechanisms uh, that, that are in the literature. So how? Well, okay. Okay. The, these organs have vitamin D receptors, and they have the ability to convert the 25 OHD to 125 OHD, and then the vitamin D can do something when, once it's, it's in fact, there are different types of vitamin D receptors, and they found for breast cancer and colon cancer and prostate cancer, if you have one type of vitamin D receptor in, in, in those organs, 
you have a greater or lesser risk of, of, of cancer or type of cancer than if you, if you don't have. So I'm a physicist and I don't understand the biochemistry, but uh, there are a lot of papers you go through PubMed, which, which might explain it, but I, I'm sorry, I don't know the mechanisms of biochemistry. I don't know if they were right about that. But for whatever reason, when you go to a tanning facility, you don't get much UVB. And I was very loud about that, and I sort of gave up on that as an option. Did you do anything about that? I mean, you, you said you do go to tanning facilities. Yes. Have, do you, have you questioned about what they're kind of... What they're, what well, okay, I'm, Robert Wagner is my, part of my source, and my own blood testing is part of my, my source. In the, probably the 80s, they thought that, I mean, maybe in the 70s, they thought that UVB was probably the better uh, wavelength. Then they started worrying about the, the when the ozone scare uh, came along, they said, oh, UVB causes skin cancer, we want to go to UVA. And it also turns out that UVA and UVB give slightly different uh, tans. One's a little darker and deeper than the other. But then they finally realized that, that UVB is beneficial. And so now they've pretty much all the lamps have 3 to 5 percent, 3 to 6 percent UVB and the rest UVA, which is about the same as mid-latitude sun in the middle of the day. Um, I, I did happen to find a, a tanning facility on Union Street in San Francisco a couple months ago. I was very proud of having a 20 or 30 year old tanning bed which only had UVA. Well, but, but that, that's, that's what I found. Yeah. That's what I found. But the ones I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I did find that if I combined the thousand I used a day of, of, of supplements plus twice a week of tanning, I got way over the top. So, uh, um, and Michael Pollock has shown in, 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 up in um, Massachusetts that indoor tanning does produce a lot of copious amounts of vitamin D. But anyway, when you go out and, uh, and try to take advantage of indoor tanning. Be sure you investigate that carefully and, and probably they're not going to be very, the people you're going to be talking to are, are pretty young women who don't know much about uh, the physics of UVA and UVB, so you might have to do a little work, but be sure that you're getting what you think you're getting, otherwise it won't work. Yes. So can you get sufficient vitamin D from indoor tanning? No, I've stopped supplements for now. I'm trying to do natural sun and indoor uh, uh, tanning salons. Um, well, I'm still too high, so I, 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 I'm slowly coming. I come down from 80 to 60 um, nanograms per, per milliliter in two months, so it had a fairly long residence time. But I have resumed the tanning, and I'll probably go back in a month or so and, and retest and see if I'm maybe uh, stabilized. Um, but, you know, what has, well, the thing about skin aging, a lot of that has to do, I'm pretty sure, with, with lack of antioxidants. Is that correct? And, and the vitamin Z helps with the collagen and, 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 and um, just, just help fight those free radicals. So, uh, I mean, look at the biggest cause of, of skin wrinkling, I think, is smoking. Uh, and that, again, there's a lot of free radicals and uses up the antioxidants. Alcohol, too. Okay, alcohol, yeah, right. <laughs> we can go down more. Van Ness Avenue and <laughs> Van Ness Street. <laughs> See that? <laughs> Oak Street, yes? Um, you had a comment about topically applying vitamin C. Yeah. Um, my understanding is that you don't want to do that because it's acidic and, and there are problems with that. Can you explain uh, more about that? Well, I, I can. I heard from Chris Masson and I didn't know you uh, Well, I prefer using sodium ascorbate on the skin. And uh, like if you want to put the scarbic acid on warts or something rather like that to burn it off. But uh, so I recommend sodium ascorbate to apply it topically. Uh, and not, not calcium ascorbate? Those. Yeah. No. Okay, so. Can you Yeah. Anybody else have a final thought here? Okay, we want to thank Bill very much, as you can see. your attention that you know this this is a forum we take we are open to a diversity of viewpoints and perspectives on these issues from uh, Bruce Lipton who's talking about the influence of, of uh, positive and negative thoughts on health to really hard science like this and by the way there can be hard science about the impact of positive and negative thoughts too so I didn't want to put it that way but what I want to call your attention is we're open to a variety of, of therapies modalities options we want to understand what's going on so uh, come back Next month and support us. And, and oh, Dave wants to make an um, Does everybody know that the newsletter that describes these talks is on the website? Everybody knows that. And we'll put a link from the newsletter about this talk to these slides.
Good. Okay. Thanks for coming, everyone. Vitamin C serum is one of the best. Right. But what form of vitamin C is it?